We need to own those things we're singing. Praise God. Let's get the computer right side up. It makes it a lot easier. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Last week I began to share with you a message. It's kind of on my heart because... Okay. I think What's the message? Siri, go to bed. Ready to send it? Anybody know how to turn that off? Siri sounds like Mark. Ready to send Okay, it's sent. Well, God just got a message. Um <laughs> Anyways, back to what I was sharing. Last week, I began to share with you a message concerning um, reflections during troublous times. And I want to continue on in that vein today. And I think most of us would say that when we go through troublous times, whether it's um, something we're believing for and it just seems like it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. It could be a healing. It could be a broken relationship. It could be a job. It could be the death of a, of a person. It could be financial provision. And then you labor and you labor and you go through all the different trials and tribulations and it seems like nothing's moving in the direction of what you're believing for. How many people have ever been there? And it seems like sometimes they come in bunches. Have you ever noticed that? You have a time of reprieve, and it just seems, well, things are kind of settled down, and all of a sudden when they start, it's usually from different directions, and it's, and it's a multitude of things that are coming, and you feel sometimes discouraged. And I really believe we need to understand that it's in times like that like that, that we need to begin to meditate before God. And uh, there's, a, there's a word that we find in the Psalms often, at the end of a particular part or a verse in the Psalms, it'll say, well, most people pronounce it Selah, but it's Sele. And it means stop, take a pause, think about what you just read or what you just heard. And I think God sometimes wants us to take a pause. And uh, because I, I really believe that in these times of trouble, I believe God is asking us to come before me and let's reason together. Because sometimes it doesn't make sense. It looks like what is happening is really violating everything you're believing for. And, and, and it doesn't come into uh, that congruence with, with the Word of God and what, what the Word of God describes. And so last week we began to share with you um, some things. When you're going through things like this and, think, and it doesn't seem like God is answering your prayer, you begin to question a lot of things. How many people besides me ever done that? And uh, even you, you, you have a tendency to make your calling an election sure. Remember we talked about that. You know, sometimes I think about the scriptures in Matthew 7, and uh, it makes me wonder, how narrow is narrow? How few is few? We all think like this from time to time, especially when we're in times of, of trouble. And uh, many times uh, makes us uh, begin to think about some of the mysteries of God. We reflect on them. God, I just don't understand. And uh, I've learned not to ask the why question. I know that whatever's happening in my life, it's for my good, according to the Word of God. But I want you to understand that when we go through these times, God is ready to begin to clear up some of the mystery that you have. If we would just take time and, and cry out to God. He understands what you're going through. He understands that the devil is trying to break your faith and cause you to doubt. 
But do you know that God allows the devil to do that in our lives because he wants to bring us into a place of confidence. God will allow the devil to create doubts in your life so that you will begin to think about it and, and, and reflect before God and meditate before God. And then God always seems to be able to give you something to hold on to that brings you back to what you were believing for in the first place. I know at least that's the way it works for me. But last week, we, we did, we did, uh, one of our conclusions was do not err by making your performance by using your performance to condemn you or justify you. And this is something that no matter how mature you are as a Christian, there will always be a temptation to get you to justify yourself by your performance, especially if it's been good recently. But that's the very mistake that the people in Matthew 7 made. When he said, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom. And many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, what do you mean? I'm not making it. Did I not cast out demons in your name? Do many wonderful works in your I even prophesied accurately the word of the Lord in your name. But I want you to look at who the subject of that action is. I, I, I. It's about my performance, Lord. What do you mean I'm not making it? And I think sometimes we don't understand that God wants to deliver us from having any confidence in our performance to save us or to justify us. We need to understand what Titus 3, 5 says. It's not by works of righteousness, which I have done, but it's according to your mercy that I am saved. We allow the devil to use a bad performance to bring us down and to cause us to begin to doubt the faithfulness of God to his children. And we have to be careful that we don't fall into the hands of the devil. So how is God going to work this out of us? By allowing the devil to cause us to doubt. And when we believe for something and it doesn't happen like the word says it should... The devil seizes the opportunity to begin to cause you to doubt the very things you say you believe. And we need to understand it is his performance that saves us, not ours. It's his performance that saves us, not ours. Whose performance are you pl uh, placing your faith in today? We need to ask ourselves these questions because trials and tribulations will come. That you can be sure of. These happen to people who are in the world who don't even know Jesus. This is common to all men. We have good days and we have some not so good days. Can you relate to that? But last week we began to share with you that one of the mistakes we make is if we limit our faith by placing it solely on the finished work of Jesus Christ. What Jesus has done for me. Our faith for ongoing and complete salvation must be extended beyond what he has done. Hebrews chapter 7, if we look at that verse, Hebrews chapter 7, in verse 25 it says, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Do you know that Jesus is able to save us to the uttermost? I guess some people say, well, what does that mean, save to the uttermost? The Lord just kind of, as I was reflecting, spoke this to me basically said 
to save you to the uttermost, Gary, is to cause you to arrive at a God-given and God-desired state of being. A state of being for which he extended his unmerited love towards you in the first place. And he did this before the foundations of the world. Do you understand that he wrote your name in a book called the Book of Life before he ever created a world? in which you would live. And he has a plan. He has a destiny for every single one in this room. Nobody is an accident. Your parents might have thought so, but let me tell you something. There are no accidents. Hello? Every single one of you are special, and God planned out a destiny for your life before he ever began to create. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. Do we always walk in them? No, but he has a good plan. We keep asking God to bless our plan and bless what we're doing. I might suggest that God would say to us, maybe we should just begin to embrace his plan. It's already blessed. How important is it that we find that destiny that God has planned for us before the foundations of the world? That God took into consideration even while we were being formed in our mother's womb. He ever lives to make intercession. I want you to know that that's motivated out of love. I believe it's motivated by the fact that God wants our living potential to become our living reality. After God has formed you and you are born, you really can't do much. You're incapable of doing anything to actually affect your destiny at that point in time. You have people that take care of you and keep you alive long enough to reach your destiny. But you need to understand that when you're born, the potential that is in you is to be everything that God ever intended you to be and he fashioned you to be. I think it's important for us that we realize we have potential, but it needs to be worked at. It needs to be released. And so he's ever living, making intercession for us. I think it's important that we realize that many times we don't have because we don't ask. We have not because we ask not. We thank God for all that Jesus has done for us, but what about what he can do for us if we, by faith, appropriate what he's doing now for us like we appropriate our faith for what he did for us? What is it that you're believing God for? Why don't you ask Jesus to come into agreement with you? What about asking Jesus to pray for you? Whatever it is that you're believing for. Because I believe that God wants our living potential to become our living reality. I want you to know that our high priest is willing to pray for us and come into agreement with us for whatever we are seeking. There are areas of your life that you haven't had victory in, but you want, and just as you think you're making progress, you fall back into the same thing. And we get so discouraged. Maybe it's because we're doing it solo. What about asking Jesus to help you? Because I believe he's the one that makes it all happen anyways. Like we said last week, he did for Peter. He says, Peter, I want you to know something that the devil has asked permission to sift you like wheat. He's asked the Father. Because he does have to ask for permission in your life unless we give it to the devil. And the Father said, 
no, 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 that's my boy. You can't touch him. Oh, he didn't say that. He said he gave him permission. This is supposed to be good news. And Jesus says, but here's the good news. I'm praying for you. And what is he praying? That your faith would not fail. And when you are converted... So Jesus is praying for a transformation, a conversion in Peter that needed to be had. And do you think that when Peter finally comes through it all, this guy was really discouraged. When Peter came through it all, you think he used what he learned in that trial to, to strengthen his brothers? Do you understand that Jesus was believing for a conversion that would not only help Peter, but help those around him? I believe it was his intercession that caused Peter to prevail. We saw his attitude. He was really discouraged. He gave up the ministry. We need to understand that every good and every perfect gift comes down from heaven. And it's available to us. His death saves us. His life transforms us. Salvation is about what he performs for you. Transformation is what God performs through you. You believe that? It's all about faith in his performance for you and through you. I believe that with all my heart. To place your faith in any other direction is misguided faith. It's a grievous error to have faith in your faith. Ooh. Now, when we're going through something and we're believing God for something, we're, saying, we're thinking to ourselves, do I have enough faith to really believe this? Question, do you believe what the Scripture says? Then you believe it. Your problem and my problem so often has been, I'm asking myself, do I have enough faith in my faith to believe that? Hello? That's, it is not what it's about. It's a grievous error. Our faith is to be for his faith to be the operating power in our lives. It's not, do I have enough faith for this or for that? Don't make the mistake of saying, I don't have faith for this. I don't have enough faith for that. When you say, I don't have enough, what you're saying is, the problem is the supplier. And by the way, let me just say that to, to all Christians, he says, I've given to every single one of you a measure of faith. Every single one of you. I measured it out because I knew your destiny. There's no one that knows your destiny like me, not even you, and I'm pouring out enough for you to be successful at what I've fashioned you to be. I don't have enough faith. Oh, Jesus, you didn't pour in enough. So the fault's really his then, right? But what we're saying is, I don't, do I have enough faith in my faith for whatever it is? We're not to live by our faith. Galatians 2.20 makes it very clear. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I'm alive. I'm a living dead man. But not me. It's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in this body, this temple, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, it's not a question, do you have enough faith in your faith? Do not place faith in your faith. One of the first doctrines of the Christian faith in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2 is faith what? Toward what? Oh, not toward your trial. If it's toward your trial, it's called misguided faith. Our faith is not to be 
directed toward those trials. I hope you understand that. Or any of the promises of God, but rather toward the one who promised. If you're believing for healing, it's not, don't place your faith in your faith to believe for healing. Place your faith in the one who does the healing. Amen? There's a difference. There's a difference. Faith is about believing in God, believing his sure word of promise, and in his faith to perform what he promises. Hello? Who makes the promises? God. Who keeps the promises? God. For him to make a statement and then back it up, he has to have faith he can do what he promises. Have you ever promised to do something and you couldn't pull it off? You see, it is the promiser that has to have the faith to pull it off. It's not my faith for healing. It's his faith to heal. And sometimes we direct our faith in ways that I don't believe God intends us to direct it. I don't know about you, but I've done that a few times. Christ demonstrated this very type of faith in his walk. We need to look at Jesus. What was the essence of his walk? It was a relationship with his Father in heaven. He believed whatever his Father showed him, and he believed whatever his Father spoke to him. You all believe that? It says he only did what he saw the Father showed him to do, and he only said what he heard the Father telling him to say. I look at Jesus, and he understood that it wasn't his faith that was the operational power in the works that he was about to do. It was God's, his Father's. He never put his faith in his faith. Put his faith in the one who promised to do what he promised to do. If Jesus did this as the Son of God, how can we relate to him? Did he have an advantage over us? Why would God tell us to do the same thing and walk as he walked and the one who set the example had an advantage over you and me? How can we relate to that? We have a high priest who can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He can relate. He was in all points tempted to sin like we, in all points, yet without sin. And why was that? Because he had contact with heaven. And so Jesus never did the works. Look at John chapter 14, if you would. John chapter 14. Verse 10, he says this, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. And I want to look at this verse for a second here. It says, Do you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? That was the question he was asking them. Do you believe that? He says, the words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. What I'm saying to you when I say, pick up your bed and walk, was not something that I initiated. It was not a result of what I wanted for that man. It was the result of hearing from heaven what I was to say. God began to show me what his plan was for that person's life when I says, pick up your bed and walk. So what he's saying here is what I speak, 
I do not speak with my own authority. And then he talks about instead of speaking, he says, but it is the Father who dwells in me who does the works. So when he was talking about him speaking, he was talking about in reference to speaking things miraculously into the lives of people. It was based on what he was hearing, not on what his desire was. How many times we have a desire for an outcome, it may not be what God wants. I remember a time I was ministering to a person, uh, a, you know, a woman I knew, her husband was dying in Van Wert, Ohio. I went to the hospital and visited him several times. And I remember sharing with him the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he looked, he lay in that bed, he looked at me, he says, Gary, he says, I understand what you're saying, I believe what you're saying. As a matter of fact, at church, many times my wife prodded me when they had an altar call, and I went forward and asked Jesus into my heart. He says, but I can't mean it. I did it because she wanted me to. And now that I want to receive him, I could say it, I could say the words like I did before, but I can't mean it. I was so frustrated. I left and come back several times to see him. I remember the last time I went to see him, and I was talking to him, and then his daughter came in. And so it kind of interrupted what we were talking about, so I just prayed for him, said, I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to leave and let you spend some time with your daughter. I go out of the room. I remember turning to the right, walking down the hall, and all of a sudden, I hear a voice behind me. It's the daughter says, Pastor Gary, Pastor Gary, come here. I went back in the room, and he says, I just want you to know that I prayed last night, and for the first time, I really meant it. The next day, he died. You see, sometimes my intention was, heal him right now, Lord, raise him from that bed weeks ago. And what if he would have answered my prayer? And the pressure would have come off him. And then he would have resumed his life and never prayed the prayer and meant it. We got to understand our ways are not his ways, and his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And we need to be careful how we appropriate faith. He goes on, he says in verse 11, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the, the sake of the works themselves. You see these works? I'm telling you how it worked. I didn't speak these into existence because of my own authority or will. It's what I received. And when I said, your sins are forgiven you, most people choked on that one. But I said what I heard him tell me to say. He goes on, he says, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, and he said he didn't do them, but the works that he did, it actually worked through his body, the works that I do, you shall do also, and even greater works shall you, than these shall you do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. The problem is, there are things that we know God wants us to pray. You know the shortcomings in your life. Should you be believing to overcome them or should you be believing for the promiser who says he will finish the good work he's begun in you to finish the good work he's begun in you? Then why don't we ask the one who's going to do the works to join us in, the, in prayer? Why don't we ask him to intercede for us and believe for a victory that he is the only one that can take credit for in the first place? As I was reflecting, here's where the Lord took my mind one time. This was shortly after Pastor Bruce went to be with Jesus. And uh, I began to think 
Jesus was 30 years old when he went into the ministry. As I began to think about that, I thought, the first 30 years of his life, did he ever perform a miracle? No. We know when he performed the first one. It says it. No. First 30 years of his life, he never performed a miracle. Silly. Think about it. So then the Lord takes my mind to, well, that's true. Um, Was it because Christ had no opportunity to minister healing or deliverance or whatever? You think there were opportunities the first 30 years of his life? I kind of think there were. Or maybe... Maybe it's because he didn't have enough faith. I kind of nixed that one pretty quick. Um, You don't have to be a spiritual giant to figure that one out. Let's look at his first miracle in John chapter 2. On the third day, verse 1, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, there's a lot of people who believe that she was not there as a guest, but she was there because she knew the family, and she was invited to function there with some responsibilities, and she was there to serve and help, okay? Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding, okay? And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Listen, if you're an invited guest at a wedding, that's none of your business. And besides that, you probably didn't know they're getting low on wine. So apparently she had some responsibility. Probably she was helping, you know, the the meal that you have afterwards, the reception. So she comes to Jesus and says, "They, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? Now, it was her concern, so probably she had some responsibility. What does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. So I begin to see, oh, um, there's something about the timing of God in all this that we have to figure in and compute. He says, my hour has not yet come. Why are you bothering me with this? (laughs) Look what his mother says. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. She wasn't taking no for an answer. I believe the Father in heaven was speaking to Mary. She wasn't just exactly a novice in in spiritual things. She was pretty well known by, by heaven. I believe she was led to go to her son and say, hey, we're out of wine. At that point in time, he didn't think this had anything to do with him. But I'm sure no sooner than he got those words out of his mouth, the father says, you need to fix her problem. (laughs) What am I going to do? You see those water pots over there? Those big ones? Fill them with water and pray over them. Now, the mother said whatever he tells I mean, so she probably understood that the way this was going to work out was going to be unbelievable. So he says to the servants, take your pitchers and fill all these big water pots with water. So they did. He prays over it, then he takes and scoops a picture in it and says, here, go take this and, and to the people who you know, are in charge of the wedding, you know, to the, the, you know, the, the one who's overseeing the wedding and, and to the bride and groom. Just go take this to them. So the guy who's over the wedding, he takes a sip and he says, wow, this, this is better. 
than what they had served in the beginning. And he says, usually people use their best in the beginning, and after people get a little bit lit up, they won't even know that the other is inferior. So <laughs> we'll save the, 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 you know, the least for last. <laughs> but you waited and served the best for last. My point is that Jesus says, what does this have to do with me? This is your concern. Obviously, if Jesus only did what he saw the Father do and say what he heard the Father say and he spoke on the authority of someone else who was speaking, he must have heard something if he said, fill the water pots. And she must have knew something. She says, whatever he says, no matter how crazy it sounds, do it. I want to read a scripture and ask you a couple questions. Isaiah chapter 53. Verse 1 says, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And it goes on to describe the coming of a Messiah many, many years before the Messiah was to come. This was a prophecy by Isaiah, and the, the question he asked in verse 1 is, who believes what I'm saying? Who believes? Going down to verse 4, surely this Messiah has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement for our peace was on him. And by his stripes we are what? We are healed. Now you have to understand that sounds future, doesn't it? Or does it? We are healed. You have to understand that in the Hebrew language there's no such thing as a future tense. As I've said many times before, if you've not heard it, there is the prophetic perfect tense, which means when it's spoken, it's as good as done. Nothing can alter it or change it. He says, nothing shall alter the words that proceed out of my mouth. One prophecy says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. But in the Hebrew it reads, Behold, a virgin has conceived and has named him Emmanuel. Because God says it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Nothing can change. No amount of prayer and fasting can move God on this. The question I want to ask, do you believe that Christ believed this report before he was 30 years old? Do you believe that Christ has read this report? Now, he knew the Bible. Matter of fact, shortly after he announced his arrival as the Messiah, they hand him a book in the Bible to read on a Sunday morning, or well, it would have been a Saturday morning. And they, the book they delivered to him, they were in scrolls, was Isaiah chapter 61. So I believe by 30 he was clear up to chapter 54. What do you think? Or 53. So did Christ believe this report before he was 30? I, I believe the answer to that is yes. Another question I want to ask. Did his natural father die before Jesus was 30? Yeah. Another question I want to ask. Was his death more about timing or faith? Was it because Jesus did not have enough faith? 
that the Isaiah passage was in force now as his father was sick and before he died? Did Joseph die because of the lack of Jesus' faith for healing? How many people think that was Joseph was on his deathbed that Jesus was praying for him? Anybody beside me think that that's probably what he was doing? Who is he crying out to? His Father in heaven. Do you think he might have even cited Isaiah 53? By his stripes we are healed. Got it? That's what I believe. Why didn't he raise him up? He wasn't a novice. At 12 years old, he knew more than most people will ever know about his father's business. I don't know when his father died. Probably Jesus was old enough to carry on the business. He was the oldest. His father was a carpenter. That was the livelihood for that whole family. And that's why they trained their sons to, do, to carry on the business. And if the father died, because the, the lifespan in those days wasn't that long. I believe Jesus was working the carpentry shop, providing for his mom until he reached 30 years of, of age. And God says, it's time to do my business now. You're also my son. You're my partner. And now I'm commissioning you into the work that I've called you to before. See, I don't think Joseph died because he lacked faith for healing. nor Jesus lacked faith for healing. I believe Joseph died in faith. Do you think he believed Isaiah? Do you think that Joseph, the father of Jesus, believed the report? I do. They had read the report many times as they went to synagogue or to the temple. But I do believe he died in faith. He died believing the word of God. He died while both of them were praying. Mary was praying. Yet he did not receive the very promises contained in the report that he believed. As we've shared with you also on numerous occasions, Hebrews chapter 11 is the hall of fame for the faith, faith walkers. I mean, we have phenomenal stories and miracles that happened to the very characters that are praised in this chapter of our Bible. It says in verse 13 of Hebrews 11, these all died, and he, he showed many people who walked by faith, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. I want you to understand that you can die in faith. In verse uh, 39, the uh, next last verse of this chapter, it says, he, he, he covered a whole lot more people now. People received their dead back to, to life. Some people rejected, you know, deliverance and were sawn and sunder and so on. He says, the world was not worthy of these faith walkers. Verse 39, and all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. I'm not making excuses for when what we're believing for doesn't become our living reality. But we, we, and don't ever start looking at yourself and say, I didn't have enough faith to be healed. Your faith is never supposed to heal you anyways. It's the faith of the promiser that heals you. When you get healed, it wasn't because of your faith, because you didn't do the healing. It was the one who's able to pull off the miracle that released faith. When God said, light be, pew, he had faith to believe it would happen. He spoke the universe into existence. He got a little bit going for him. He got faith for a lot of stuff we don't have faith for. 
Jesus said, if you just had a mustard seed of faith, just a mustard seed, you could say to that mountain, be moved and cast in the sea. And if you wouldn't doubt what you say, it would happen. Why? Why do you only need a mustard seed? You only not need enough faith to believe that he can do it. That he has the faith to do it. Right? No matter what your problem is, your trial is, do you really believe that Jesus has enough faith to pull off what you're believing him for according to the scriptures? So God's words are as true before miracles start happening in Jesus' life as they were after the miracles began happening. Do you believe that? But for 30 years, he walked, never sinned, walked close to the Father, had an open heaven, Never once did he declare a word and someone got off their deathbed. But when it was time, he stopped funeral processions and said, rise up. You see, timing has more to do with it than we think. The times and seasons are in God's hands to bring to pass what he purposes. And what he purposes will happen at the predestined or predetermined times he purposed them to happen. In Daniel chapter 2, look at that for a moment. Daniel chapter 2. In verse 20, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of our God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have, to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. Sounds like God is the one who controls the seasons and the dispensations of time. When things will happen. Hello? I mean, I I look at, as we've been looking at the gifts, does God want all of us to covet to prophesy? Do you know that from Malachi, the prophet Malachi, clear up to John the Baptist, Prophecy was almost extinct amongst God's people? Was it because the word was no longer true? And did God determine when it was time for it to begin to be activated again? Yes. We are subject to the times in which we are born and are living. I want to encourage you, though, when things aren't working out according to what you're confessing and believing in the word, remember, put your faith in the one who's spoken the word, not your faith to deal with what he's spoken about. We need to believe now that the time is getting very near. In Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, he says this, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, this is after his resurrection, and he's now appeared to them in his glorified body, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Because they knew the word of God. They knew the promises. And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. As I've told you several times before, Samuel, when he was a young lad, learning to be a a man of God, under the high priest Eli, God began to speak to him in the night, and he thought Eli was calling. He'd run to Eli, and he says, What do you want? He said, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. This happened several times, and finally Eli remembered in times past when his ministry was under the anointing that God would sometimes speak to him in the middle of the night. 
And he says, all you have to do, oh, it's, it's God speaking to you. Next time you hear the voice say, here I am I, Lord, your servant, speak. He says, in those days, the word of the Lord was rare and there were not frequent visions. It wasn't because of the lack of the spirituality of that generation. The, the previous generations had caused God to pull his hand back a bit. And so it's an appointed time. God is in control of signs. We cannot make things happen before they're supposed to happen. So timing is as important as faith. I want you to remember that sometimes God says, it's not that my word isn't true. For my purposes, the timing's not right. We'll look at a few more scriptures before we quit here. Um, look at Luke chapter 4 for a moment. Luke chapter 4. Quickly, we'll begin verse 34. And he, he, then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, now he's speaking to Jews. I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah. When the heaven was shut up three and a half years, or three years, six months, and there was a great famine throughout the land, he says, there were many widows struggling who were part of the nation of Israel, the, the frozen, I mean, the chosen ones. And then he says, but to none of them was Elijah sent. Elijah didn't go, he didn't just went, he was sent. God never sent him to a widow in Israel. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. We're talking about a Gentile, not a Jew. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of Elisha the prophet. And none of them was cleansed except Naaman, who was a Syrian, a Gentile. Now this ticked him off. He says... You are my people, but I never, God never instructed either one of those prophets, Elijah or Elisha, to go to someone in Israel. They went to an uncircumcised heathen. Of course, the Jews took that personally and they tried to throw him off a cliff, but he just said he walked out of their midst. In Matthew chapter 15, Verse 22, he says, And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after her. She's disturbing the meeting. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Was Jesus under the direction of his father? Did he tell him you are to minister exclusively to the lost sheep of Israel? Do not minister to Gentiles. That was the word of the Lord to him. However, God is in control. So, he says, after that, he, she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, even, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, Remember, he only speaks by the authority of someone other than himself. And he speaks to this woman, O oh woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. So it's not because of the fact that you are one of God's children that these promises are real. Because he performed it for even the, the, those who weren't his children but because the faith was released and God instructed him to do so. And so 
it's time for us in Haggai chapter 2, we won't go there, but he talks about building the house of God. He said, now, you people who saw the temple before the, uh, the, its destruction and, and you were taken off to Babylon, you people who saw the temple, this new temple that's been rebuilt, you, you understand it doesn't hold a candle to the old one, right? Right. And he says, but I want you to understand that the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former house, even the beginning house. He was speaking prophetically about a temple that Israel would build that will exceed the temple of Solomon in beauty. We know that temple will be built during the millennial kingdom. That's what I believe. We know that the river of life will flow out of it. And I believe, as it is with Israel, so it shall be with the church. I want you to understand this pattern that is a heavenly pattern. It's as true for the church as it is for Israel. And the early church, with all her glory and the power and, and all the things that were happening, he says, I want you to understand it's time for you to get serious with me because I want you to start believing. For the glory of the latter house, the latter temple, which is the church, the church is the temple, will be greater than the glory of the former. That will not happen without the gifts operational. When you look at the early church, the gifts were operational. And I believe with all of my heart that God wants to do a work that will cause a stir like we've never seen before. And so this pattern that is in heaven is, is repeating itself. And so we, not, we need to give ourselves to the building of God's house in troublous times. And I believe we need to let patience have her perfect work. If you're going through a trial today, if you're believing for something and you've been disappointed because what you're laying hold of is not happening, do not give up. Hold fast. I'd rather die in faith than live doubting. So whatever you do, believe the word of God, whether it's happening or not, and believe me, let your patience and your endurance have its perfect work that you might be completed and that the purpose of the trial that you're going through might be served in your life because I believe that God works all things together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And I want you to understand, do not put faith in your faith. The one who promised has the faith to fulfill the promise. And do not be slack concerning the ongoing ministry of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and not just to rely on what he has done but rely on, on what he is doing today engage him get him to partner with you in whatever it is that you call trouble amen father in Jesus name we pray that you would help us to understand some of the mysteries that have eluded us in times past but Lord, that more than anything else, we would trust you, even though we don't understand. Father, you never called us to be understanders, but believers. But Lord, I believe that if we believe and trust you, you will grant us understanding of things that we did not understand before. Father, I pray that whatever the trial is in each and every person's life here, whatever it is that troubles them, Lord, that you would be their comforter in the time of trouble. Lord, may it cause us to come to you even as you've directed us, Lord. You said, all you that labor, come unto me and I will give you rest. Lord, may we come to you. May we enlist your priestly services even now in the very battles that we're facing, believing that you are praying with us and for us. And Lord, we thank you for your ongoing intercession. You ever live to make intercession for your people. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you.